Okay, cool. Welcome back. So um, hopefully everyone's doing well and uh, looks like uh, in general this lecture time is doing decently well. Uh, we have roughly the same amount of numbers that goes up to around 50-ish um, in uh, once everyone starts popping in. So I think this is promising. I'll confirm uh, um, maybe through Slack uh, within tomorrow, um, but I think this is probably a good time for going forward. Okay, so cool. Um, let's uh, directly jump into the topic for today. So now we, as you know, we started electrostatics um, and there are a few new ideas we introduce um, in, in this segment, in this uh, section of the course. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, this part is going to be very abstract, um, especially today. Uh, we're going to, um, I'm going to build on some of the concepts from yesterday of electric field. Um, show you why it, uh, what does it do, and uh, we'll get, that will lead us into the concepts of uh, electric potential, which is a completely new concept, and it's quite abstract, to be honest, um, and uh, electric potential energy as well, which doesn't sound as abstract, but uh, the, um, when you try to disentangle that with potential, uh, it can get a little confusing. So that's a little heads up for you guys. Um, on the other hand, uh, it, is, it, is also, it is less... Um, it is more similar in the same line of thinking as 3A, as looking at forces and looking at how things move. So in some sense, the whole thermodynamics, the whole thermal physics chapter, it's a little bit of a detour in that sense, because uh, from, as, from day one, we were talking about the goal of physics, right? Uh, the goal of physics is to find out how things move and how the universe works, which I uh, hopefully convinced you that any question you can throw at how does universe work can be translated into uh, how, how things move. And, um, and then in thermal physics, so fluids certainly fall into that category about um, do, how, how do fluids react, uh, how things react in fluid, which is buoyancy, right? How when things react inside fluid and um, how do fluids themselves move and react. Um, and then in thermal physics, it's a little bit different. We asked a more philosophical question of what is heat, what is temperature? And we realized heat comes from the idea of internal energy and internal, every object has internal energy. And one, when one object's internal energy go decreases and the other increases, that transfer is called heat, right? So heat is in, sense, in essence delta uh, internal energy, okay? Let, let me turn that off just to be more uh, clear. Uh, so that is a, a little bit of a detour into a philosophical side of the question of, okay, what, what is this thing called heat? And then we realize, okay, things have internal energy. And then uh, we move on to the, the practical side of that is how do we make use of this internal energy, right? So I, I now, okay, we learned the uh, philosoph philosophical side of, okay, things have internal energy. So even they don't move externally or not in, under the influence of some external non-contact forces that is like gravity or whatever that's pulling onto it it itself has energy, all right, now, now that I know that, how can I benefit my life with that? How can I make machines, right? How do I get heat engines out of that? So, um, and then, so that leads us to the topic of thermodynamics, which is the study of turning uh, heat flow into useful work or vice versa. You take use work and then artificially make heat flow. Um, that will create you know, air conditioning, uh, refrigerators and all these uh, devices. So that draws us a little bit away from just a pure, very pure idea of how things move. Um, although it comes from it, but it draws us away. Now we return back to there and we introduce the concept of electric fields, right? So um, a, because this, the next concept of electric potential leads directly from it. So I'll, uh, I'll um, let me summarize a few takeaways that uh, the maybe four key ideas from yesterday that uh, you need to know and you, which will bring us forward, okay? Um, it, so this is lecture 11. I believe, and 19. So we introduced uh, this whole new force. It's a non-contact force. It's called the electric force. And this guy uh, acts on something called charges. More specifically, we should say electric charge, right? And this electric charge comes in two flavors, it comes in positive and negative. Okay. And I draw a lot of parallel with the idea of actually mass. And in some sense, we'll see, uh, um, I'll circle back to that. So uh, the electric charge comes in two flavors and they follow a rule. It follows the rule that if, uh, if they are 
like charges will repel and opposite charges would attract. Right? It follows this rule. No one knows why, um, at least back then, no one knows why this is. Why do they come into flavor, a big question. Uh, why do like charges repel? Why do opposite attract? Um, believe it or not, now in the past 40 years, um, with uh, the discovery of this um, whole new, I mean, people talk about quantum mechanics. It's, uh, you hear that in documentaries, but people don't talk a lot about uh, quantum field theory. In my, in my opinion, it's one of the most underrated theory of re the recent uh, discoveries, uh, which grant, it, gave so much more insights of how we, us understanding where things come from. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's not that long ago, you know, in, in, your, in, your, um, in your mom or grandma's um, uh, generation, they actually, people, scientists back then, it's not that long ago, we do have no idea why these things, why do like charges repel? It's a very fundamental question as you can appreciate, but yeah, it's a very new um, understanding, maybe 50 years now, moving on 2020, I guess, roughly 20, 40, 50 years-ish history. And okay, so this gives the direction of, of uh, the force. So, so we know that, okay, if I have like charge, the direction is they will experience a force that repels. Opposite charge will experience a force that attract. Now, how about magnitude? The magnitude is given by Coulomb's law. So that's the Coulomb's constant. That's the two charges, uh, magnitude of the two charges. And make sure you put in the magnitude. So this should always be positive. Let's actually emphasize that. Make a note in your notes that this um, is always positive. So if you have a negative charge, plug in the positive value, the magnitude of it, right? Because this is calculating the magnitude. The direction should be given by this rule, okay? Uh, uh, all right, we'll uh, get back to that as well. Um, and we draw the idea of parallel with gravitational mass because uh, this follows a very similar formula that any mass uh, will attract this way. Now that's the similarity. And what is the difference? The difference is mass only comes in one flavor and they always attract. So anytime you have two mass, M1, M2, they will always attract. So that's the different part. That's the similar part. Again, we now actually know why this is, which is a very amazing achievement. So if you look at over here, you see the Qs play the role of M, right? Distance as distance, you know, that's the distance between the center of mass of these objects or the center of charge of these objects. Uh, K is just a constant, like I say, to convert Coulombs. Uh, in fact, it's to convert uh, Coulomb, you can work this out, right? Coulomb square per meter square into Newtons. This is basically just because we, me we, we are used to measuring Newtons a certain way. We're used to measuring meters distance a certain way. Um, and uh, when historic, for historical reasons, um, we measure charge by the unit of Coulomb. So there must be a, a certain number, like an exchange rate to make sure the units work out right that you go from Newton to uh, whatever this unit is. Th this is. This K does not play any physical consequence. The real takeaway from here is the larger the charges, the larger the force, the further apart they are, it decreases, force decreases by, the magnitude of the force decreases by distance squared. <coughs> Excuse me. So this plays the exact same role here, as you can see. So you, this is um, uh, one thing, we, one takeaway you want to uh, appreciate from the last lecture of this. And in some sense, you see, this is electric charge. So sometimes you can actually consider mass as a gravitational charge. We sometimes, in a deeper sense, we think of basically in the world, there are different types of charges and mass, what we colloquially in our everyday life call mass is basically gravitational charge. So the, the, these things that uh, the, the more gravitational charge, the more mass they have, you can think of the more gravitationally charged they have. That's why they experience a bigger gravitational force when they are attracting each other. Whereas here we have different type of electric charge, right? So um, I don't know if you thought about it this way, but this is a new, um, potentially a new perspective or a different perspective. You can think of what, what is mass. And so m gravity is not that much different from electric charge. So it, in some sense, there's a lot of parallel as we'll continuously draw uh, today as well in helping us understand it. And then we brought up to uh, electric fields. Okay, and th there is two key purpose for electric fields. Okay, well, so um, today, yes, last time I, I explained the main purpose or the main reason why it was developed. And today I'll explain the second purpose, which is on the more practical side of it. Okay, the first purpose is, purpose number one is to uh, have a way to describe how influential certain things are electrically. So how uh, influential, or how strong an object is, right? This is how you can explain to uh, someone, an uh, eight-year-old or someone who's never done physics, what is the deal with it, what is the electric field for? It's to measure how strong something is. Well, let's clarify, if they ask more details, then you clarify, uh, if they ask you, what do you mean by strong? I mean, you know, like electrically strong or electric, uh, I don't, it's not 
gravitationally strong. It's how electrically strong there is, uh, they are. And uh, today, uh, I will basically will cover this. It's on the practical side. What is uh, of of why is it useful? Okay. Um, so how did we answer this? This is um, we say first of all. Uh, we had that conceptual question and say that it's not useful to just think of force because if I just think of force um, and I ask, okay, if I put an object here, so this is the source charge and I use a test charge over here to find out, okay, let's, let's calculate the force on the test charge because I want to see how strong this is. So let's see what is the force it exerts on this guy. Okay, so we calculate it. The magnitude is given by this, um, but now you realize uh, it is a bit problematic because let me express it in terms of the source and the test. And that's the distance, right? And it's a bit problematic because it depends on my test charge. If I have a if I have a bigger test charge, I will get a bigger force. But that's not what I want. I want to know how strong an object. In fact, I want to some source that I'm interested in. I just want to know how strong this guy is. I don't care for what this is, right? Um, of course, one way to do it you you standardize what you use to test. You, you say uh, from now on we all use carbon ions to test it, you know, or electrons to test how things strong. Yeah, that's one way. Um, but a more uh, general way is, I, let's, let's not care about that and we divide away the, the magnitude of the test charge, right? And this is, gives us the new quantity, which we call electric field. So the electric field is only a function of the source. So you, whenever you say electric field, it is of a source at a point, okay? So if we, divide that on the right, you see what I am left with is this, right? And you see precisely what it's dependent on. It's dependent on the source charge and the, po the, the location. A point means a location. Okay, so this is actually quite important. Let's make it an important note is uh, electric fields depends only on two things. One, the, charge, the source charge, the charge of the source, Okay, so if the charge of the source is large, you will have a larger electric field, right? Uh, the stronger the source is, that, that's precisely what you want. You want electric field to measure how strong this is, but it also depends on the location. Okay, so these are the fine prints, which means every time you write down E, it should always be, you should always have subscripts of what at where, okay, of what source at which location. Okay. Now we don't always write this, but uh, that is just pure efficiency. For efficiency wise, we don't write it out every time. Uh, but you need to know, every time you see an E, you should ask yourself, it, what is it measuring of? What's the source and what, what location? In this case, in this formula, the R is a distance R away from where? Away from the center of the source. So I'm, th for this particular case, you see the electric field measures um, the cer certain distance away from the source and it's a property over here, okay? All right, so um, the definition is something you need to know. Uh, basically it's that I'll just put in a box here um, of a certain source at a certain location is the force on some test charge. You use to test it, but you divide away by the test charge. Okay, so it's the force per unit charge you can look back at your notes, the full word definitions, force per unit charge on a positive test charge. And you always use a positive test charge to test it. Okay. So this gives the magnitude of it, of the electric field. And basically we call this the electric field strength. And then how about the direction? The direction we use the idea that if um, any positive test charge, we learn that we draw it this way. We draw it with field lines. Let me use a new page actually. So electric field lines. And the elementary idea is learn that positive point charges, it looks like this. Negative point charges, it looks like this. Okay, so what do these arrows mean? It means it gives the direction of a positive test charge. Okay. So I think last time I said it, uh, th these are the, the, if you want to say in a more fancy way, it's the, these lines traces the motion of a positive test charge. If you want traces the motion 
of the positive test charge of that. Okay. Um, yep. So uh, now, uh, and then I gave you. I think uh, we had some exercise. Maybe uh, I will um, give you the answer today of different shapes. If you have a, a plate or a plane of positive charges, then um, the field lines look like this. So imagine, is, does that make sense intuitively? Uh, if you put a positive test charge here, is that what it'll, how it will react? Yeah, sure. So that um, there's some edge effects as well. Um, so technically, on you know on the edge, um, if you put a test charge directly above the plate, yeah, it will probably go up because this is positive like that, right? Um, but uh, let's focus on the main bit. So sometimes we disregard these edge effects. And uh, to, you, you will, uh, in your homework or in the discussion tomorrow, um, you will actually put these to practice and see how you actually implement the uh, plugin numbers and, and how you work with these. And uh, you will hear the term an infinite plane a lot because, so uh, sometimes I'll symbolically draw it with a few arrows like this to signify that the, it goes out to infinity because <laughs> the reason why we invent this ideal, of course, in the real world, there's no such thing as a plate, uh, a plate with you know some chart here um, that extends out to infinity. <laughs> it is just, of course, in the world that this doesn't exist. Um, but the reason why we invent this ideal concept in physics, you see, we always extract out the ideal concept, is because we, we sometimes we just want to analyze the the very uniform part of it. Right? So if it goes out to infinity, there's no edge effect. I, I just eliminated the edges altogether. So I can purely talk about a very uniform uh, electric field that looks like this. Okay. And same thing, if you have a line like this, um, then you have the electric fields would um, sort of radially go out if this is positively charged. And the same theory goes, there's some edge effects over here. So let me erase that. And uh, sometimes you will hear us talk about a line that extends out to infinity. So this is an infinite line or an infinite wire. Um, so you will only have this um, very uh, uniform, I can't really draw in 3D. So maybe let me draw a cross section. So um, let me say this is going into the page like this. So on a, on a cross section, the overhead view, overhead view, the, you'll have, um, it will be radially outwards away. So we sometimes use this word radially outwards. Okay, um, it, instead of me drawing everything, maybe I'll just show you a few pictures over here um, to give you the idea of it. So in, uh, let's look at this uh, dipole over here. Um, you it basically just combine the, um, the two that I've drawn over here, you join up the lines, you'll get something like this. Uh, it's called a dipole because di means two, pole means you know, the positive and negative, like north pole, south pole, positive pole, um, like this. Uh, there's a question, is it wrong to draw the arrows coming from negative going to positive? Yes, it is wrong. Um, yeah, be, because uh, we, the, the con oh, well, there's technically, uh, in theory, there's nothing wrong, but we, we need to choose a direction. And that we, the direction we choose is um, the electric field line skip the direction of positive charge. So if you draw the, as, as long as we have, there's a universal understanding in the community that when you draw the line with an arrow like this, that means that tells me which way a positive charge would go. Okay. That actually brings up a good question is, what if I actually put a negative charge here? So what if I put an um, a electron over here? All right, well, uh, so first you ask, so what if that is a positive charge? Well, it will follow the, the direction of the field lines. Well, if a positive charge is do, go do one way, the negative charge would basically do the opposite, right? But it, it also makes sense because if, if the field line is going away from your source, then that means your source must be positive, right? Because that is how it's defined. So if you put a negative charge here, it will go towards that source. Yeah, you're welcome. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, so uh, yeah, everything over here should make sense. Uh, if you put a po tiny positive test charge here, it will basically, first, if it's very close over here, it will get repelled outwards first. It, um, but as soon as it goes very far, now that it's far away or somewhere halfway between the two, then it realized that it doesn't care about this guy anymore or care about this less because as you saw from Coulomb's law, it's the force from the red one on the charge is getting weaker if, when it gets here. Now it starts to, this guy starts to become more influential as it, as it um, at first over here, the red one is dominant over it, right? Now the blue one is dragging it back. So that explains why this line is the shape it is, right? So that's that, um, that should be pretty obvious. Um, 
if you have a single charge, something like that. Um, one way to remember is uh, you, you can remember it as field lines always goes from positive to negative, as you can see from the dipole, right? Um, or even another, maybe uh, we'll actually get to capacitors uh, next week. This is a topic next week. A capacitor is basically two plates, one positive, one negative. Right? So you can see that if I put a positive test charge here, the field line will tell me it goes straight up like this. It'll get attracted to the negative side, repel from here, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you can also think of, it's a good check to remember this rule. It always goes from positive to negative. Right? Um, so once you draw something, you can double check it that way. Um, if you have two positive charges like this, uh, yeah, I think uh, just Google a few images, you'll get your get the hang of it. Um, this is the wire that was uh, more difficult for me to draw, but it's easy to see like this right? in, in three dimensions. If you have a wire, um, and you can actually see the edge effects for the capacitor, but if I have, if my plate is infinite, um, then I have this ideal situation where I just care about the uniform part. And we'll learn a formula to find out the electric field in the middle of these two plates like this. Um, and uh, the electric field at the edge is more complicated because it's <laughs> changing all the time. But here it's pretty constant and uniform. It's very simple. So lucky for you guys, we learned the simple things in life. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, you see this is a cross section like this. So what happens if the wire is negative? Can you, yes? Should be pretty simple, right? Just reverse the direction of the arrows. So it'll go inwards like that. I'm not gonna draw it out. Um, you can read the textbook on that. Um, yeah, you can have a cylinder like this. You can have a lot of uh, examples um, to be able to draw that. Okay, so um, essentially the field lines gives the direction of um, what happens to anything you put over here. Uh, so now you have two ideas. You have the direction and you have the magnitude. So you can combine those in an electric field vector. So the electric field strength plus the electric field lines together, you can create this concept of the electric field vector. So let's say I have some source over here. I don't even care what shape it is. Um, and as long as you draw its field lines like this. Okay, so I, let me put a charge over here. And then I want to ask the question, what is the force, both the magnitude and the direction, when we, not just the magnitude, I want to know what is the force on this, uh, this Q, okay? Let's uh, maybe do a simple one first. It's just, let, not to do with the arbitrary one, but do with, deal with a actual uh, spherical charge like this. And then you ask, what is the force on, on Q? All right, this method number one. You can do it the old fashioned way. So method one is just use Coulomb's law and calculate the force. Okay, so the force, the, uh, the direction Let's do direction first because it's easier. Um, Coulomb's law, remember, the way we taught it, it does not tell you anything about uh, the direction. It only tells you the magnitude. The direction is determined by what I call common sense, positive, positive, repel. Okay, so direction is here. Okay, so it's uh, away. Let me put it a little bit lower like this so I can describe it in the, in the, using the word um, to the right. Okay. Now the question is magnitude, and magnitude is given by F. Uh, K, Q source, um, and uh, this little Q over here, right? And it's distance squared, depending on how far away it is. Now, if this is one Coulomb, you, you will go and plug in your numbers, and then you plug in one, you plug in, let's say this is uh, 10 Coulombs. So you plug in, if this is an SI unit, you just plug in 10, you plug in one, you plug in the distance, blah, blah. But now, if you change your mind and you say, I want, what if I put two Coulombs over here? then you need to go and redo your calculation. You'll go like scrap this, I need to redo it and plug this whole thing in the calculator like this, right? Um, and then someone tells you, okay, good, thank you for your answer. Now we have a new interest. I want to find out if I put five coulombs over here, what will happen? And then now you have to scrap it and then re-enter re everything in your, uh, in your calculator. Now there must be a more efficient way and there is, this is method number two, which is where electric field comes in, what I said in the beginning of today, purpose number two. So uh, is you, under, you, you first think of, okay, this is the definition of electric field. Let me rearrange this. So I'll multiply out to the other side, right? So remember this is E of the source at a certain location. And if I first calculate this, let me first calculate the electric field of the source, 
right? And once I know that, uh, imagine I have a number for that, okay? Then it is extremely economical, right? Because let's say I've calculated that, uh, let me use orange for that, and let's say I've done that calculation, so I got the electric field of the source. Then whatever charge you have here, you don't have to re-plug in into Coulomb's law all the way like this, and you just need to plug in what you are interested in, whether this is five. So let's say you, you know, okay, this is uh, whatever, you plug everything in and it's um, uh, 57.6 Newtons per Coulomb, whatever, I'm just making this up. Right? And then they say, what, what is the force this guy experienced if I put it, if I, if I put a one Coulomb charge here, you just plug in one and multiply by 56.7, 57.6. And if they say, oh, I changed my mind now, you don't have to go through and calculate, okay, this is nine times 10 to the power of nine, uh, the distance is certain meters, the Q, you don't have to plug that all in, you just have to do this. Okay, so that's why we're interested. So if you can calculate the electric field of the source at a location, let's call that uh, P, let's call this location point P, right? Then you know for every charge, you, any possible um, charge you want to test, you can just plug that in. Okay, does that make sense? Cool, yeah. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, the, the reference chapter is pretty much basically uh, 20, one for electric field. 23 is electric potentials, which we'll get to at the second half of today. Okay. Right, so this is purpose number two. Uh, let's actually put in practice. Uh, maybe I'll you go back to this comment over here. Is Let's say you know the, if you know the electric field of the source here, right, at, from a electric field is of a source at which location, then you can know, then it's easy to find the force. The force on Q is just Q times the electric field of the source. So that's another reason why we care about this. Okay. Of course, the natural next question is, how do we find it? How to find E. Okay, before I do that, uh, We'll give a, actually this example will exactly tell us how to do that, okay? So um, uh, let's, if I have a single charge, single source, single point source, I should say, should be pretty simple. Um, let's do a negative example, actually. So let's say this is, um, Q source is negative five coulombs, okay? And ask ourselves, what is E over here, okay? Right. So if it's a single point source, you can just use Coulomb law to figure this out. So you figure it out once and for all. So you put any Q over here, I don't mind what Q you put, and you calculate the force on Q, on this is the test charge, on Q test is K5, I'll put an absolute value to emphasize that I care about the magnitude, and Q test over, let's say a uh, distance, let's actually plug in real numbers, um, let's say 10 meters. So you plug in 10 square like this. Okay, so that is the force on here, but this gives you the magnitude. What is the direction? Draw a free body diagram. Um, which way will, will this attract? Remember, we always use a positive test charge, right? We call the definition of uh, electric fields. So the positive, it means that it will, the direction is actually pointing that way. So uh, let's continue with the magnitude. And the, since electric field of the source is force on test divided by Q test, then you just have K times five over 10 squared. Okay. More generally, if I just call this QS and I call this R, so we have this formula Q of a point source is K Q of the source, put a magnitude if you want, if you want to remind yourself over R squared. Okay, so this applies for any point source. Right. Now, uh, I think we did this last time, but what if I have more than one source? What if I have multiple point source? Okay, there's two ways to do this now. Okay, you can do it from first principles. I'll call this from first principles. You use the basic idea and calculate it. All right, so let's say I have, uh, Let's keep it in simple in one dimension first. Everything lies on an axis. Um, if I have a negative five over here and I have positive 10 over here. Uh, let's say this is uh, two meters 
and let's say I'm interested in the electric field here, electric, the total electric field here at P at this point. Okay, and this point, let's say it's three meters away. So what you can do is you calculate, okay, I'll put a test charge here. I'll put a positive test charge here, Q test. And I will calculate the, the net force on the charge is K, I'll put, oh, uh, now I have two charges. Um, and this guy, the minus five is dragging it towards it. The plus 10 is dragging it, uh, pushing it away from it, right? So uh, they are, up, they are both competing in different directions. So now you need to draw a free body diagram because when you have more than one force, it's actually, you should always draw a free body diagram as you can see here. Um, yeah, but it should always start with that. So let's say that due to the minus charge, it's push it, pulling it this way, right? So it's called an F5 from the minus five one. And then for the 10, it's pushing it this way. I don't know which one is stronger yet because although the 10 is stronger in magnitude, but it's further away, right? So I can't really tell before I plug in the numbers. So uh, we can, so now you plug in the numbers and see uh, the net force on Q should be, uh, let's call this positive. So uh, the right-hand side is positive. So F10 minus F5. The magnitude of F10 minus the magnitude, if you want, put a, this to remind yourself of F5. If you understand it, you don't need to put it in every time, put in the absolute value signs every time. Okay. Um, so F, uh, F10 is given by Coulomb's law. So usually I don't put in the absolute value signs, but uh, you can start with that to emphasize it for yourself. Uh, so that is, you put in 10 of, and then times Q test, divide by, what's the distance you should use? You should use two plus three, right? Five squared minus K, this time you put in minus five, but absolute value sign, right? So just put in five. So this is, comes from this, and then Q tests, because you've taken care of the direction already. Uh, and what is the distance you should put in under denominator? You should put in three, right? That's the distance between Q tests and this guy, all right? So now you go and uh, add everything up, um, and then, so you get a number, and then you, the electric field at P is this whole number. Let's, yeah, it's just, uh, call this the hashtag, right, this number. So it's the net force on test, Q test, divided by Q test. So you take this number and divide by Q test. It so it should actually cancel whatever you have over here and get the result. So this is, I will call it method one again. So from first principles. But there's an easier way. Yes, the blackboard is lagging for me as well. <laughs> uh, I can see that. Um, sorry about that. Um, and I, I've done everything I can. I've refreshed my computer and uh, connected with a uh, landline. <laughs> so, so bear with it. Um, right, so this is method one. You see it's not very efficient. Now there's a cleverer way. Because I noticed uh, this is going to come in very useful. Let me actually change the color of this. Um, for a point source, I actually have two point source. So let, let's not just redo the calculation from scratch. Let's use what we already have. So let's use this formula to directly give us the charge over here. All right, so, sorry, the field over here. Okay, so how do we do that is you draw the free body diagram of the fields. Okay, I'll start a new slide. Let me copy, this is positive 10 negative five, and I want to find, the question is the electric field here, equals question mark, okay? So first, let me draw the electric field lines. I draw, let's, so the idea is draw a free body diagram for the electric field, not the electric force, okay? So what is the electric field due to this? Well, negative charge, electric field lines looks like this, remember? So if I do draw, the electric field lines for the negative guy. At this point, it's going to be pointing this way, right? At this particular point P, this point P, it's going to be pointing this way. So this is the electric field due to the source, due to minus, due to five. I'll just keep it simple. Let's just call it E5. But this is saying the electric field by the source five.
And let's draw the electric field lines for the positive one, which is like this. So uh, if I extend it all the way to here, right, that um, you will see that at this point, the influence, remember electric field is the influence, it tells you the influence of the source is this way. Again, I don't know which one wins because um, 10 is larger than five in magnitude. So technically that should be longer, but then again, it's also further away. So I don't know which one actually wins. We need to uh, balance that out with one is the inverse over or inverse square distance, but the linear in uh, magnitude and stuff like that. All right, and now instead of calculating the force, we directly calculate E net. Calculate this directly. So it's E10 minus E5. Again, put in a magnitude sign if you want. I usually don't do this once you get the hang of this, but at first put in an absolute value sign. Remember it's this. So you need, I, I would, the, the diagram is very important. Um, show up please. There you go. <laughs> uh, so this diagram is important in telling you which one minus which one, right? So uh, three body diagrams, it, it, it comes into play again, it will come in again and again in the rest of the course. Uh, so yeah, so that will tell you the direction so you know that it's this magnitude, right? This arrow minus this arrow, okay? And now you know the formula which we are gave for a point charge, just to re recap, right? For a point source, this is the formula. So you just use it. K times the source is 10, uh, R which is five squared, right? So this is the two plus three meters minus k, but remember you put in the magnitude over here, if you want, again, put in an absolute sign, k5, this comes from absolute value of minus five coulombs. Again, coulomb is an SI unit, you see I don't put that, but now you understand, right? And uh, yeah, and then you plug in the numbers, uh, and then what, it, so there you go, so you've got the field. If you want to find out, now, now, you, now that you know, so you know the net uh, field at p, Right, the net field by both of them, right, by both source at P is some number. If I end up putting in, I say, hey, what is the force of this guy? Right, I, I want to put in a source that is positive three coulombs and ask yourself and ask me what is the net force on this? Then you don't have to redo everything and you just say the net force on this Q, on this new Q is just uh, Q times E net. So you just plug in three times whatever that number you got from here and you got it in Newtons. Okay. Um, so in the homework, basically this summarize, I'm not gonna do too much examples uh, that is uh, going to be relegated as your job. Um, and also in the discussion session, we'll sh show you more of these problem solving techniques. Uh, that is what the discussion sessions are designed to before, that is a very poor handwriting, sorry. Um, to, to focus more on the problem solving technique, I'll show you the philosophy and the motivation and the concepts here. Um, but you'll get things like, what if I have two positive charge? What is the electric field here? Well, now uh, let's say this, is, this time it's positive 10 and positive five instead of positive 10 and negative five. So now both of them will be put, put, put pushing in this direction, right? Because if you draw the electric fields for both like that, um, then at this point P, P2, let's say point number two, both the E10 and E5 would be pointing in this direction. So this time, the net field over here is you add them up, you don't subtract them. So I, want, I did a less trivial one to show you how, if they don't add, you subtract, right? Um, incidentally, if you're interested in the point over here, how about the net field here? In, in uh, let's call this point three, P3. But this time is different, right? So uh, E10 is pointing this way, but E5 is pointing this way. So this time you subtract. So it's always important to draw the, the uh, diagram. Um, uh, in this second example, I'm making both of them positive, positive 10 and positive five. So you, you draw a quick free body diagram, which is the fancy word for drawing the arrows in which direction. And then you, you'll know which one do you subtract which one. Right? So if you're on this side, if you want to find the electric field on, on this side here, then uh, the electric field due to 10 would be this way. The electric field due to five would also be this way, right? So the net is going to be this way here. Uh, in the middle, I can't tell. I need to actually com compare these two numbers, plug it in, but I can tell over here, the net is going to be uh, this way. If this is point 0.2, let's say point 0.4, like this. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. 
there's some questions, but I think the, those are answered. Okay, so, so far I've answered. If you have uh, a single charge, how do you get the field? And uh, if you have multiple single charges, so if you have a point charge, uh, you calculate the field from first principles. If you have multiple ones, you can do it from first principles, which is calculate the net force and divide by Q test, or you just add up all the fields like this. Um, this method two of just adding up all the fields, it's called principle of superposition. Okay. Um, again, that's in your textbook, so I'm going to save time and not write that down. The principle of superposition is this method two. It's the name of this method two. Okay. Um, just a quick emphasis since I see the discussion going on in the chat. Um, the arrows represent how a positive charge, positive test charge would react. So put a tiny positive test charge um, uh, to, to on, at that location and imagine which way it will start flowing. That's where the direction of the field lines go. Okay. What if I have more complicated ones? Okay. Let's see. So in fact, I'll give a few important ones. Um, I'll give three important ones. One is a sphere. So not a point, but a sphere. And then second one is for a plane. And the third one is for a wire or a line. Let's use the word line. Okay, so a sphere charge, plane charge, yeah, I'll keep it simple, but a sphere, sphere charge, plane charge, and a line charge, okay? All right, C is actually very simple. Um, we so we talked about if it's a point like that, if it's a, if it's a tiny point, then this is the formula. But if it's a sphere, it's actually identical outside of it. Now, uh, as we need to um, worry about, because there's two regions here, there is inside and outside. Okay. Inside is a little bit more complicated inside of a sphere. It depends whether it's an insulator or a conductor. Uh, I will probably go back, I'll call that, uh, this the more advanced technique tomorrow. Um, but so for now, I'll just comment on the outside. Outside is simple. Outside of a sphere is exactly the same as a point charge. So if this sphere contains positive Q amount of charge, uh, it is, um, doesn't have to be positive Q, just Q. It's just KQ over R square, but remember this R is from the center of the sphere. So it's exactly the same. So you can put a star and comment is the same formula as point source. So a sphere source and a point source outside, it doesn't care, okay? Outside of uh, the sphere. Try to make it, what's this? Inside, it depends whether it's a conductor or a insulator. Okay, we'll, we'll circle back to that. So for now, I, I'm not gonna introduce that yet. For a plane charge, now notice I haven't proved to you this is the fact. I'm just telling you these as facts, okay? Um, this is the part of the syllabus where uh, uh, I am actually going to defer it because it's one of the more advanced topics. I can find Canvas. Oops, I think I, never mind. So uh, if you look at Canvas, um, you, you'll see the syllabus that uh, there's the topic called Gauss's Law. That is uh, probably the most difficult uh, mathematical top, uh, topic in, in the course. So um, I'm going to circle back that to that at the end. Um, we're probably not gonna put a lot of focus on examining that, so don't worry about that. Um, but at the end, it's, uh, it's, not, it's always, you know, I make a big deal of we not just, we're not machines trying to just memorize formulas. Unfortunately, this is the time um, where I break that rule a little bit because that is a, a big complicated part. Um, uh, so I will swap the order and first tell you the formula and we'll get used to using these formulas and get a feel, get a better feel of it because I, I, I completely understand that this is very abstract the first time you see it. So let's get a feel of things first. I'll just, um, it's not too hard to understand this formula to be honest. Um, the, the fact that if you're away from the sphere, um, especially if you're very far away, this sphere just looks like a point charge to you anyway. So no surprise if you're outside of sphere, it follows the same formula as uh, that. So also remember this should be magnitude of of Q, um, because we're every time all these formulas, I'm telling the magnitude, and I'm going to emphasize as many times the direction. Uh, use field lines to determine it. Field lines or free body diagram of field of uh, of the electric fields to determine uh, to, to determine the direction which way it goes. Okay. Um, 
All right, so yeah, so now the next tool is a little bit less obvious where it comes from. The reason is from Gauss's law, which will come back in the end, but I'll give you uh, the formula so we can use it, okay? So uh, the formula for the electric field. So first let's draw the field lines, right? So it looks like this. For now, I'll treat everything as positive. If negative, just reverse these arrows. All right, so what is the electric field here? At a certain distance, let's say distance R or let's say distance D away. Here. The electric field is given by this. It's Q over two epsilon A, okay? So this is the electric field for a plane charge, okay? So depending on the geometry, you use different formulas to get this. I'm let me emphasize once again, I'm not proving this, I'm telling you this. We'll see where these magic formulas come from. I did not pull them out of the hat. There's a reason behind this madness, but we'll come back to it, but learn this. So it's Q over A. There's an easier way to actually learn it, right? So Q is the charge that is on here. That's so depends on what is the charge. It could be 10 coulombs or you know, uh, 0 0.1 coulomb, whatever on, the, on this plate. Um, again, if it is negative, make sure you put in a positive number of here because again, I'm going to be sick of myself telling you this, that this is always calculating the magnitude, but there will be people making these mistakes. So uh, put a star and remind yourself in your notes this, okay? Um, yeah, and what is A? A is the area of this plane. Yes, yeah, so A is the, whenever you define a formula, make sure you specify everything, area of the plane. Okay. This is the constant I introduced last time. I'm not going to write it out too, too much. It's called a permittivity of free space. Okay, maybe I will. Um, it's uh, it's uh, this. So Coulomb's constant, this is 9 times 10 to the power of 9. Um, but uh, this is another constant. They're related. Um, in the old-fashioned days, people always use K. But a more modern way, we realize this number is actually more fundamental than Coulomb's constant. So a lot of the more modern formula, um, you, you can switch to this um, like that. Okay. So, let me introduce a new definition. It's called surface charge density. Okay, let's break this down. Uh, so it's called sigma, and it's defined as the charge per unit area. Okay, remember what is density? Uh, dens uh, mass density. Remember, we in the beginning of the course we talked about density, but I kind of hinted there's lots of different types of density. There is population density, which is the number of people per the area of United States, right? Number of population per area of the country, then you have population density. Uh, you can have mass, right? There's the amount of mass per unit volume, then you have the mass volume density. Um, here, we're looking at how much charge is distributed per unit area. So this is charge density, and I'm looking at surface charge density because the next I'm going to introduce the idea of a linear charge density which is lambda, it's the amount of charge per unit length. Okay, so that's how much charge per unit length. Okay. With the introduction of these two new things, one is sigma, one is lambda, um, then it makes it much easier to write this formula. This formula becomes, oops, this formula becomes sigma over two epsilon, because you see Q over A is sigma. So let me extend this box here. And uh, I'll give you the final one on the line charge. So the electric field over here, first of all, again, let's say this is positively charged and uh, the field lines look like this, right? So if you're interested in a point over here, let's say, right, so I'm interested in this point, a certain distance D, uh, let's call it R, certain distance R, um, a perpendicular distance R away from it, and I want to find out, hey, what's the electric field here due to the line? And this is the answer, the electric field due to the line is Q over two pi epsilon naught L, uh, R L. But in terms of lambda, in terms of the line density, it's much easier to write. Like this. Not that, not a whole lot easier, but a little bit easier, right? Because you see there's Q over L over here. 
and Q over L means it's lambda. Okay, so this is how much charge per unit length, this is how much charge per unit area. L, oh, sorry, thanks. Uh, I should define my variables, right? Uh, good. Q is the amount of charge on here, L is the length of this wire. So let me define on this. So this Q amount over here and L is the length, right? So the charge per unit length goes in here. All right, so uh, I also introduced um, might as well. Uh, since we have charge per unit length, charge per unit area, we should have a charge per unit volume as well. So that is totally true. If you're thinking that, you're correct because let me make some space here to introduce also rho is charge per unit volume. So this is the volume charge density. Now you might immediately be thinking, I've seen rho before. Yeah, that's mass density, right? <laughs> that's mass per unit volume. Um, so this is volume charge density, but uh, we run out of variables at some point, so uh, we can't invent too much new variables. So yeah, since it is also per volume, uh, let's just use the same uh, variable rho. So depending on the context, if you like, you can say rho c, rho charge, um, like that, but uh, no, no one really do, does that. It's in the context, it shouldn't be confusing. It should be, uh, it should have to say, it. it should be the same concept. Okay. Epsilon naught is uh, called the permittivity of free space. Look. Uh, we, at your notes from yesterday. We have discussed that already. The number is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 or something like that. Just Google that. Uh, I remember K. Uh, K is uh, 10, 9 times 10 to the minus 9. That's easy. Okay, so that means I can also rewrite this slightly differently. S Q over 4 pi epsilon r square, like that. We see k is one over four pi epsilon. So I can write it like this as well. So um, now it looks very hard to remember these, but uh, I want to point out an interesting fact over here. If you look at the, if you look at the denominator over here, see if I can circle this part, you see four pi r squared, does that ring a bell? That is the formula for a surface area of a sphere, right? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that it shows up over here? Um, so it's like q over epsilon uh, and four pi uh, r squared, like this. Okay. And then if you uh, look at this, does this ring a bell? Two pi r is the circumference of a circle. Okay. So if you have a cylinder, um, oh yeah, the next one I should also make a cylinder, but if you have a line, if you think of um, just wrap this around by a cylinder like this, then the, uh, the, if you wrap it around with a cylinder of radius r, so what you, this two pi r is precisely the circumference because if this is r, this is this, right? So um, there is a deeper reason behind the, uh, this coincidence, um, but uh, that is from Gauss's law. We'll see that at the end of the course where these magic numbers come from, but just want to point it out, uh, you'll see some geometry over here. Another uh, fact to point out is that I'm looking at a certain distance d away from the, from, I want to find the electric field at a location, certain distance d away from the plane, right? And do you see any d over here or r or any distance? No. This sigma is constant over constant, right? The area doesn't change, the q doesn't change, um, uh, doesn't change with distance. Um, and then this is another constant, two is a constant. The two you can kind of think of because it have two sides right away, um, you like. Um, it doesn't depend on D. So even if you go very far away, it, it is actually very constant. It's very uniform. Now this doesn't include the edge effect. So actually all these formulas are for ideal planes and ideal lines. So it's actually for infinite planes and infinite line, if you want. Uh, you don't need an infinite sphere. There's no such thing, but yeah. So this, these formulas are the very uniform part of it. Um, so if you are, if in the real world, there's no such thing as infinite plane, but if you have a very big plane and you are very close to it, um, imagine you're a little ant living right next to uh, just, you know, one centimeter uh, above the plane, which is 10 meters by 10 meters. As far as you're concerned, that's pretty infinite and you don't see the edge effects. Okay, so these formulas are the ideal ones without the edge effect. Okay, good. Uh, one last comment is if you find these hard to, Greek, all these Greek letters hard to remember. Um, remember lambda is the Greek letter for L. So linear, L for linear, right? Uh, there you go. Sigma is the Greek letter for S, right? Surface, S for surface. Rho is, I have no idea. <laughs> so, but uh, there you go. Let's make your life a little easier on things. Okay. 
so that's the end of it. Um, there's a few advanced things uh, about electric fields we'll, we'll circle back to tomorrow's lecture. Uh, but the basics is, just to summarize, for point charge, the formula is this. Point charge uh, and outside of sphere. I'll just save a little writing. So both of them follows this. For uh, infinite plane, it follows this. For an infinite line, it follows this. So point slash sphere outside of sphere, infinite plane, infinite line. So I remember the two pi r part over here. Right? And this one, the two, I, I remember it because there's two sides of the plane. So in your homework or discussion session, we'll see some examples. The discussion session should, we'll do some examples that actually help your homework. So um, I always like to treat everyone as adults and it's up to you if you uh, want to utilize the resource we provide. I highly recommend it because this TA will go through it for you. Um, and uh, the, uh, so the, um, you, you'll get problems like, for example, hey, what if I have two planes? And now um, I ask you, what is the electric field here? Okay. Um, outside, in fact, I can ask a couple. I can ask part A, uh, find the electric field here, part B here, part C here. I can ask you each different regions. Um, then let's say this guy has an area of uh, one meter square, let's say one by one, and a charge of five coulombs. This guy has a charge of negative five coulombs and the same area, let's say, right? So, first, uh, because it's easier to work in terms of densities, um, so let's first calculate the density. So, this is. Um, Let's, yeah, five over, yeah, so five over one. I was thinking to make up different numbers, but yeah, it will save some time. So five coulombs per one meter square. So it's five coulomb per meter square. Right? Since everything is in SI units, uh, don't worry too much about the SI unit. So this is um, plate number one, Q1, Q2. So plate number two, sigma two is also five, right? Five coulomb per meter square. Okay. So uh, let's try to find A, B, C. Um, the first thing you do is you draw the electric field lines. So this is um, a plate, so it looks like this. Which way would the arrow go? The arrow will go this way, right? Because this is a negative plate. How about this? This is a positive plate. The arrows would go away from it. Uh, this side, actually, so you can, join, you can join up the lines, right? They actually work in together like this, okay? So, uh, We'll draw some free body diagrams of the electric field um, for, let's start with B. So at this point, what is the electric field due to plate number one? It's going this way. So E1 is going this way. The electric field due to plate number two is also this way. So they add up. So the E at B is E1, the magnitude of E1 plus the magnitude of E2. So in the beginning, when you start to getting used to this, you can uh, write down the absolute value of science to remind you you're adding the magnitudes. And uh, so one, you, you put, uh, so sigma over two epsilon plus sigma one over two epsilon, sigma two over two epsilon. Um, what is it? So five over two epsilon plus five over two epsilon. So together you have five over epsilon, right? So uh, you plug in this number, eight point whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then at the end, the units is SI units. You can plug that back in. It's Newton per Coulomb because the electric field is force per unit charge, right? So the SI units is force per unit charge, Newton per Coulomb, and you're done. So you, you get this number. How about C? So if you draw the free body diagram for C, what is the electric field due to plate number two? Well, the electric field due to plate number two is this way. How about the electric field here due to plate number one? Well, the field lines for number one, you know, goes like this, right? So over here, the electric field due to plate number one, remember these are infinite plates, by the way. Um, in order for me to use this formula, I need to assume these are very, very big plates, um, or approximately infinite going this way. Okay, so this time the net field is, so the E net at C is this minus this. So if you plug them in, this is five over two epsilon minus five over two epsilon. Oh, my apologies. This is negative five, but when uh, the density is negative five coulombs per meter square. But when I plug this in here, I plug in the magnitude, right? I plug in the magnitude of this guy in here. So you see this actually cancel out. So the electric field is zero. Okay. So uh, th there's actually no electric field here because uh, the electric field of this guy cancels the electric field of this guy. Uh, it's very symmetrical on the A, so I'm not gonna work out too much detail. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, this is a wrap on the electric fields. So now let's uh, ask ourselves next, what is this question, what is this thing called electric potential? Okay, so the idea I need to bring you back to is to, the whole point of physics is to find out how things move, right? And I convince you basically, we, we try to ask how the universe works, but a lot of the time you can convert that question to how things move. Basically, you want to find this formula, you seek this magic formula, x of t, right? Or uh, in 3D, then you need x, y, z of t. So you want this vector, right? So sometimes called r of t. Right? So you want, this is a vector r in some three-dimensional space that has x, y, z, uh, and you want to find out as a function of time, where does this thing move in, in 3D space like this. Um, but in the essence is to find out this. So this is the position function function or the function of motion. And how do we find this? Basically, you need to find v of t. And how do you find v of t? You can find a of t because if you integrate uh, v of t, you get x of t. If you integrate a of t, you need to, you will get v of t. So how do you find a? Well, uh, the whole point is you find, you use Newton's second law. You need all the forces on the object. Okay, all forces or the all net forces, right? All slash net. Because F net will tell you A. That's why we care about F net. And now we've introduced a new concept called field is that if you know the field at some point, so if I know the electric field here, I will know the force on here of not only one guy, but I know the force of any charge I put over here. So any test charge over here, uh, if, I, if I know the, let me draw the background field lines, uh, let's see, it is in this field, right? So this blue little test charge will experience the net force of this guy will be Q test times the electric field at that point. So now you see the sequence over here. First, we calculate field, then it will tell you the force. The force will tell you the acceleration. So field tells you the net force, Right, and the net force will tell you 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 plug that in here, and it will tell you the acceleration. You take the acceleration, you integrate it, integrate acceleration dt will give you v of t. You see the you see where this is going, and it will give you that. That's why we in, are interested in electric finding electric fields, and it is very economical because I don't have to calculate the force every time. Once I calculate it this once and for all, and then I know whatever charge you put at that point, as soon as, as long as I know the electric field at that point, any charge there is just multiplied by that, I'll know the net force. Okay, right, good, okay. So now, um, that's very good. That, that motivates our understanding. Hopefully now you will get a very concrete understanding of how, what, why is it useful, how to calculate it, right? The, the question, the next question is, okay, so I need V, I need A, I need F. Okay, so now I need E, how do I find E? That's the whole point of the previous slide, right? The, ho the whole point of uh, this three formulas is to tell you how to find the E, depending on if you, or, of your source. What is creating that electric field? Is the thing that creating that electric field, is it a sphere, is it a point charge, or is it a plane, or is it a line, right? These are the simplest, the three simplest uh, geometries that will, that will create the electric field. Um, and we have a formula for that. Anything more complicated than that, you don't have to worry. That's the <laughs> beauty of um, being a beginner physicist. You focus on just the simple geometries. If it's a triangle, don't worry. <laughs> We're not gonna test you on that, okay? Um, now, there is a, this is one philosophy. This, this chain, this green chain of logic is propagated by Newton, um, who, who motivated this is how you find your ultimate goal here. The whole, this is, can be summarized as the force approach. Okay, so you find the, you find the force, this is the earlier step now, you find the field, you find the force, you find the acceleration, you find the velocity, you find x of t. Now there's a whole parallel approach called the energy approach, as you know very well. In 3A, you, half of your course is dedicated in the force approach, half of it is energy. If I give you a question, um, if you want to jump off the cliffs and then find out what is the end result over here, right? What, what is the velocity at the bottom of the cliff? One way is, okay, you do F equals MA, you calculate acceleration and you integrate that, you find V. But there's another way is you, you ask yourself, what is the energy over here? You have MGH, amount of gravitational potential energy and zero kinetic energy. 
And then at the end, you will have zero gravitational potential energy. And you should have all that will get translated to here. So now you can do a very simple calculation. Don't even need to draw any free body diagram. And uh, you don't need to even look at uh, any, integrate any acceleration to find the velocity. You can, in, with a simple line, you can calculate that the final answer is this. The energy approach is very powerful, but it's a completely different way of thinking. This way uses free body diagrams, whether on E or on F, where you you'll calculate that. This side, everything is a scalar. This is not vectors. So it's very easy to work with. It's a mo little bit more abstract. So the idea of electric potential is actually in this approach, okay? So uh, this is a whole, it's almost like you, if I want to find out the end result of uh, electron in the electric field, I can do it the force approach, or you can forget everything we just talked in the one past one and a half lecture and just learn how to do the energy approach. Now, each of them have its benefit and disadvantage because over here, if I want to find X, now it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, you can, but it's, so each of them have, have their different pros and cons, right? So now we, this is the motivation of why we care in shifting into here. So first, let me give you the definitions of things. So we start off by learning what is the definition of electric potential energy. Okay, so we know what gravitational potential energy is. Actually, we don't quite. Now we uh, will give you, we know the gravitational potential energy on Earth, but not in general. Uh, you will see it here in general. It's actually the work done, actually any potential energy, any potential energy, the definition is, is the work done against a non-contact force. So the key word is, it's basically work done against a non-contact force, okay? That's what potential energy is. So an electric potential energy okay, is usually denoted by U, don't ask me why, is <laughs> the work done against the electric force. And the gravitational potential energy, if you like, uh, you can call it UE and UG, but uh, for now I'll just, I'm not gonna work with gravity too much. So it's the work done against uh, the gravitational force. Okay. Let's make that a little bit more explicit. So what is work done again? So you bring it from point A, from some initial point to some final point times F dx in one dimension at least, right? If, in, if it's in three dimension, it has to be a vector and it has to have a dot, a very explicit dot product over here. For now, let's focus on the one dimensional one. So what do we plug here is you plug in the electric force. For the gravity case, that is from initial to final, you plug in the gravitational force. Okay, so what is potential energy in one word? It's work done. But work done against what? Well, work done, you, you need to push it with some force, right? Uh, it's work done against the correspondent force. If you're talking about gravitational potential energy, plug into gravitational force over here, right? So let's quickly see what is the gravitational potential energy on Earth. So you need IF, you need to plug in the force of gravity on Earth. Well, we know that on Earth is mg. Um, if you, let, let's call it dy because if I want to, if I put an apple on a table like this, so Earth, I put an apple at a table, I'm moving it against, uh, let me call this the y direction. Um, you can call it the z or, or you can call it the x direction, but let's call it the y direction going up, right? So the, uh, you, this is the direction you move against the electric, the, the gravitational force, right? So uh, let's call it dy and your initial and final, let's actually plug in um, the initial and final. Initial, let's say y equals zero, final is y equals some height, dy, okay? So this is the gravitational force on Earth. Now you can do the math, right? Mg is a constant. So you go from y equals zero, y equals h, dy, integrate this mgy from zero to h, plug this in and you get mgh. And that is why you have this formula mgh when you normally talk about gravitational potential on Earth. Does that make sense? How about in, in space? What, is, what if it's not on Earth, okay? So what if I want to find out uh, what is the gravitational potential energy when I bring the apple? Um, this time it's going to, uh, my apple is going to be here. It's going to be far away from Earth so that the radius uh, is, I cannot no longer approximate the, 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 the uh, distance between the apple and the, 
Earth is just the radius of the Earth plus a tiny number. Now it's actually very far away. What is the gravitational potential energy of this guy? Well, now I cannot use mg. I need to use the universal gravitational law. Right? So the gravitational potential energy of the apple over here is I need to use um, the universal law, which is gm of Earth, m of apple over r squared dr from some initial to some final. Okay. So first of all, you see a bunch of constants. Let's pull them out. That's the easy part. M of the apple, initial to final, one over r squared dr. Now, what is the initial and what is the final? Um, the, normally on Earth, we have a very well-defined initial point. The initial point is, well, from the surface of the Earth, and then you move it to some height. Well, the final point here is pretty uh, clear. You want to measure the, uh, um, let's say here, Rf or just r, a particular r over here. But what's the initial point? Um, it, it, we shouldn't be so self-centered that we think that everything initially starts from the surface of the Earth. Because if now we're talking about, what if this is uh, the apple, it's not the apple, it's the moon. I want to find the gravitational potential energy of the moon over here. I'm not really trying to bring the moon from the surface of the Earth to here. So we need some mutually agreed upon starting point. Okay, so the final is, I can erase that, the final is uh, at a distance r, right, from, from here. But the initial point, I need some universally agreed on point. Now, where it, imagine in space, right, this is like the black darkness of space, so which goes well with my blackboard. Where is a good point to be starting? It, like in the middle, you know, that, that, in the space, nothing is, there's no special treatment for someone. Now, a good place to start is when you, assume the place where there's no gravitational influence on the object, okay? So if I have uh, on Earth, that is, that is nice because if we're standing here, although we are under the gravitational influence, we kind of just go about our everyday life, you know, standing on the surface. You assume we, that we don't really care about gravity until we go up in some height. Now we suddenly care about gravity. So we actually set this at, as a reference point. So this is our reference point. And then anything that we bring it up, right? our final would be anything that is away from our reference point. So here, our reference point is something that, is, that has no gra gravity. Again, I put no in quotations because it's not really no gravity. It's just we don't, it's effectively no gravity. Um, and the final point, now there is some gravitational potential energy as, uh, as we think of it, All right? Uh, so how about universally? Is there some place where there is no gravity? Well, if this is a mass over here, gravity extends out almost everywhere in space, but it gets weaker and weaker. If you go all the way, this is the idea, if you go all the way to infinity, there's no gravity there. It, it decays down, it's a one over r square, right? So it decays all the way to zero. Um, so our initial point is, this is, we need to choose a reference point where there is no gravity. We usually choose it as infinity, the reference point. This is just what the community decides on if you like, you can choose a different reference point. You can say somewhere else I'm going to call zero. Um, in fact, right, remember the MGH formula? Technically, it should be MG delta Y. Sometimes you see the books right there. You really just care about the difference in height. You don't really care about MGY1 or MGY2. It's really the MGY1 minus MGY2 that really tells you uh, the kinetic energy, that, uh, that, that the physics is encaptured, encapsulated in the difference in potential energy. It's always difference in potential energy that causes motion, not the absolute potential energy, right? So whenever you look at, uh, so um, yeah, so if you have a reference point, now you can talk about difference. And uh, let's actually do the math over here. All right, so what is integrate one over r squared? Uh, so that's minus one over r. You can check uh, your calculus and uh, pull out the minus. So I plug in one over r minus one over infinity. So I have minus g m e m a over r my, uh, plus g m e m a over infinity. So you see this, we can call it, call the absolute potential, gravitational potential energy. And this is the, reference point. So if I had just put in some R naught, some reference point, that would be R naught. But if I choose infinity wisely, then this goes to zero, right? So the absolute GPE at infinity is zero. The, it sounds very technical, but 
the idea is very simple. It's just saying that there's no gravitational potential energy at infinity. That's what it's saying. So this is the formula, GPE, gravitational potential energy of something at distance r. And you don't worry that it's negative. There's no problem. It's really difference in, in potential energy that is uh, going to contribute. So potential energy itself can be negative. That is completely fine. Okay. So now, uh, if you understand this, it's very easy to change this to electric force. Just change it to a charge, Q1. This is Q2. And then instead of putting G M1 M2 over R squared, you put K Q1 Q2 over R squared. That is electric potential energy. Okay. So if, now if I have Q1, Q2, and I want to find the electric potential energy, which is denoted by U. It, the definition is uh, from a universally chosen point, infinity to a given point R, and you plug in the electric force over here. So uh, K Q1 Q2 over R squared dr. So K Q1 Q2 infinity R 1 over R squared. Maybe in the first step, uh, I'll keep it as initial and final. And then the second step, I'll plug in um, my final and my initial. So yeah, it's kq1 q2 minus 1 over r squared. This is identical, so I'll just go very quickly. You have minus kq1 q2 over r minus this thing over infinity, which is 0. Okay. So the conclusion is the electric potential energy. I don't quite like having, using u, to be honest. So that's why I always write EPE. Um, but uh, yeah, some, it's not very intuitive when I see u. Also, different books use different symbols as well. Like that. Okay. And that's pot electric potential energy. Um, and uh, I will use another 10 minutes to talk about electric potential. Um, and it's, it's also not too difficult. It's a little bit confusing, but uh, it's a little bit abstract, sorry, but it's not too difficult to, to explain uh, once you understand potential energy. Okay, so potential is it's the same philosophy as electric fields. Okay, uh, now I have Q1 and Q2. Sorry, the boards are slower and I have to wait for it. <laughs> um, yeah, so if I have Q1 and Q2, now uh, that's good. So I know the energy of uh, Q2 with respect to Q1, um, but now I just want the electrical, how strong Q1 is. I ask the same question as like electric field asks. Uh, what if I have a source? So this is my source. And I just want to find out how much energy, you know, not, energy is not the right word because, but uh, maybe I would just use the word, how strong this Q source is. Okay. But remember, you, you would go like, yeah, we just introduced the electric field. We can do that with electric fields. Yes, true. But now I want the energy approach. I, I forget about everything we learned about in the past one and a half lectures and see, is there a different way to do this? And the philosophy is the same, but this time we don't use force. It's not force per unit charge, right? It's energy per unit charge. So you introduce a new concept, not force per unit charge, but you forget about force. You assume you never learn about it. You just learn about what potential energy is. It's the work done against something, right? Okay. Uh, and now you, what you can do is you find a test charge, put it here, calculate the EPE that the, the, the test charge has, and you divide away its own charge, right? So if you look at this formula here, or this formula here, you see the electric potential energy depends on both Q1 and Q2. That is not, that's not what we want. I just want to know how strong Q1 is. Do you get the idea? It's the same idea as the electric field. So we first calculate the potential energy because that's the way we know how to do, and then we divide away whatever you're testing it with, okay? So that is, I'll write it down formally, but that is the idea. Uh, in fact, let me give you the formula first. The, the symbol is V of a point charge is minus KQ, uh, I'll use Q source over R. Okay. Just see this, right? EPE is minus KQ source Q test over R, uh, not R square, R. That's the difference, right? Um, and then now you divide away Q test, and you'll get this. So this is called the electric potential. Okay, so it's the work done per unit charge. If you like, fit in the work per unit test charge. 
for bringing, so that's the key part and there's the fine prints, for bringing the test charge, uh, for bringing the test charge, positive test charge. Our test charges are always first assumed positive. Positive test charge from infinity to a given location, R. to a given location. So in, this is what I will call a formula. It's not a definition. This is the formula for, formula of V, electric potential is V, for a point charge, point source. Because if it's a different source, if it's a plate, it has a different formula, okay? Um, so actually, I will also need this V uh, plane, and I also need a V line charge. Okay. Uh, but the definition of V is the work done to bring a positive charge charge from infinity to R divided by Q test. If you like, this is identical to initial, final force, the electric force, dr. And actually not initial and final, it's from infinity to a given point because infinity is where there's no electric potential energy. It's so far away that all the electric potential energy is assumed to be zero at infinity. So we use that as the reference point. So we take that and bring it to a location R and that is the definition. So in a sh short answer question type, if you're asked to define what is the electric potential, you can write this out in words, work done per unit test charge for bringing a positive charge from infinity to R, <laughs> commit that to memory. Um, I have <laughs> done that. Uh, or you can write the first part of this, or you can write the second part of this, uh, or you can write all three uh, parts of this. That's also uh, okay. I, I, I encourage you if, you, if you do it in the equation form, so this is in, uh, word form, this is an equation form. If you do it in equation form, uh, I encourage you probably write out all three um, like that. Okay, so um, the orange word says a given location. So from infinity to a given location. So usually I will just say the location R, it's a certain distance away from it. Okay. Um, now, uh, th there's uh, one last slide uh, I will explain is one relationship between V and E, and also the, I'll give you this plane and the line. That's it in the next last four minutes. So if you stare at this, this is potential, right? So potential is from infinity to R. I'm gonna write it out many, many times, right? The electric force, right? So this is the, the work done uh, to bring it from infinity to R per unit test charge. But if the test charge is constant in this uh, whole story, right? The test charge doesn't suddenly go from one coulomb to become five coulombs, it stays constant. Now you recognize this part. This is force per unit charge. Sorry about the delay with things slowing me down. <laughs> this is force per unit charge. So what is that called? Electric field, perfect. So there's a deep relationship between, uh, if you like, you can title this part, the relationship between uh, V and, uh, relationship between V and E is exactly this. I wouldn't call this a definition of V. Def the, this is the definition of V, the top one, right? The bottom one is a nice formula. Uh, it's a nice uh, relation. Okay. Between V and E. Okay. So if you know E, you know V. You know V, you know E. Now you, we tie everything back in full circle. Is, um, you can do things completely in the E side of things, so it's just a force approach, or you can forget about that and do things with V side. So tomorrow in the discussion session, you'll see the examples of how we use this idea. Um, and uh, right, so that makes it also very easy for us to find out for the plane, remember it's this. Um, and for the line, remember it's lambda over two pi R, right? There's an epsilon not always on the bottom uh, and that's two pi R, the plane is two. So we can find out the V for the plane is, well, from infinity to R um, and you this time plug in for the plane. Now, fortunately, everything on, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to ask uh, if I want a potential, it's also a property of a location. So I want to find the potential here, V here at some distance R away. The idea is you, you bring a positive test charge, Q test at infinity, and you bring it from here all the way to here and ask how much work does it take? Let's make this green. 
how much work does it take to bring it from infinity to the location that you're interested in? And then you divide, once you calculate that, you divide by Q test. That will be the potential, okay? It's called the potential here. So uh, the math is simple because this is a constant, so you pull this out. All right. Now, uh, actually, let me call this whole thing uh, E plate or E plane. And you know it's a constant, so it's E plane times uh, integrate just R, so you get R from infinity to R. Now, this is interesting. This, this subtlety over here is E plane times R, that's good, but it's minus E plane times infinity. Now, it looks like I'm subtracting infinity. Um, so I need to actually modify my equation a little bit because the, the problem is here. This is a very subtle part where the electric field doesn't actually decay. So at infinity, it's not really zero. So that's slightly a problem. Um, so in fact, instead of using infinity, we need to change the definition a little bit and call that just some reference point, R naught. So here it will be minus R naught, okay. And that is the, um, the, and you see this is, as long as you, you calculate the same, um, uh, you use the same R naught for all the planes that you, so if you have two plates over here, um, and both, you, as long as you both use, um, let's say my R naught is, is this, R naught is 10 meters away. That is my reference point. Every, I'm going to measure my potential always uh, starting from, uh, from here not from infinity, but I bring it from 10 meters to a certain point, um, then, then you're good. As long as every plate, you use the same common starting point. Okay? It, there's no you know, definition um, which you should choose. For a point charge, there is, because it's a natural point at infinity, we'll just call that zero, right? Because it's nice and, uh, but for a plate at infinity, it doesn't decay to zero if it's an infinite plane. So um, that's one subtlety over there. So I'll put that in a box. So for V plane, it's E plane times R minus a constant. And that constant is the same for, for almost uh, everything, for, ev for every plate you do in your problem. And finally, for line, uh, you, can, uh, you can do that as well, is V line equals to, from this one does decay to, to zero, so that's good. So you just put in E line. It's right, so a lambda over two pi epsilon r dr. Okay, I'll go through the math quickly, two pi epsilon infinity r1 over r dr, and you have a similar situation log like this, infinity r. Okay, so you, uh, that is the expression for it. Now, usually we, you won't get too much problems on this absolute potential with a, with a line, um, but uh, the, the philosophy is, is the same. Okay. The philosophy is just doing this. All right, so um, I think this is the main takeaway. Um, electric potential energy is the work done to bring a charge from infinity to a certain point. Okay. The, trying to find the slide, yeah. Uh, the electric potential energy is the work done, uh, and work done is you know, uh, doing some work against a certain force, right? To, to, bring the charge, uh, to bring the charge from infinity to here. Okay, so bring a charge from infinity to a given location. Your initial point, it choose some reference point. Usually, unless there's a special case like a plane, um, usually this is at infinity. You bring it to a point. Um, and how much work you've done, that is the potential energy. Because it's called potential because um, it has that potential if you, if you release it, now it will turn into kinetic energy. So th because you've done that amount of work to bring it there, this conservation of energy, right? So it's stored that amount of energy. And if you release it, that it can, it's like gravitational potential energy that you bring it from the surface of the earth to a certain height. You've done some work against the gravitational field. So you put in some work, you don't see it, but it's in a potential at some height, okay? As soon as you release it, it'll, just, it'll drop and it'll turn into kinetic energy. So this is a similar issue. Um, let's say this is both positive. If you take the two positive charges, you put it together like this, you have done some work because they don't naturally go together. Now, if you release it, this amount of potential energy will get converted into kinetic energy. So they'll move apart with that kinetic energy. So with conservation of energy, you'll know exactly how these things move. Um, so that is what electric potential energy is. Every time you're confused, just think gravitational potential energy, okay? 
um, and potential is just this, divide by a test one. So you decide which one you're more interested in. One is the source, one is the test. That's potential. Just show you this one. So it's the work done uh, to bring, this time you differentiate that you are interested in one guy more than another. Uh, so you treat one as a test charge. You find out how much work it takes to bring it to that location, divide by it. And now you know the potential of your source. Okay. So uh, these are the main concepts. Uh, tomorrow in discussion session, uh, I know there's a lot to take in. Uh, you will, um, yes, I can go back to the last slide. Uh, you, you will uh, utilize some of these concepts. Um, some, by the way, some of your classes discussion session would uh, discuss the electric field. Some of them would discuss uh, electric potential. Um, and the TAs will probably send, put out the recording, Zoom recording on the discussion session page of the Canvas. Um, and uh, you, you can go and look at the, uh, other explanations as well. Um, yeah, and in tomorrow's night's lecture, uh, I will uh, also go into more, um, give you more examples. There's no new concepts tomorrow night lecture. Um, all the concepts is here, and I'll basically just get you more and more comfortable with this very abstract idea. Okay. All right, lots taken, but thank you for staying, and uh, have a good night. I'll stay for a few seconds if there's any questions. But yeah. If not, have a good night. Let me go back to the slide with the plane. Yes. Here. So this is the potential of a plane. It's the electric field times. So there's an electric field times the distance away. Um, the electric field, you know, it's uh, sigma over two epsilon. So if you if you don't want to use E plane, you plug in what is the density here, and then you you plug in oh, how many meters away. It's three meters away, so you plug in three meters away, um, and then you plug in R, and then uh, it's minus a constant. Um, this may look weird, but in discussion session, actually tomorrow lecture, um, we'll, I'll do some examples, and this will look less weird to you. Uh, the minus constant. It's not that surprising. You have minus constant every time you do integral. There's some constants. You know, it's not that surprising. It looked weird at first. Um, and this is the relationship because from the definition, uh, you can see that it's basically directly related to E. Can I go to B linear? Yes. Yes. So this time you plug in the E for the linear if my slide reacts. Okay, good. Uh, so so look at this, the relation right between B and E, but this time you plug in for a line uh, and then you, this time it's one of R, so you get a block. Okay, all right, so I will have these slides up in the next uh, few minutes after I end and uh, you'll get to see the slides more and the recording. Right, have a good night. Bye.